he he's a controversial figure. There's there's no question about it. He is strident uh, in various opinions uh, that fly in the face of others who are equally, if not more, strident in their counter opinions. Hello and welcome to the next episode of Beneath the Law. My name is Gavin Tai, here with my partner friend Stephen Teal. Hi, you, Gavin. How are you doing? Well, I'm a little trepidatious. Is that a word? I, I'm. I'm. A, yes, I think it is a word. I, you know, I, I'm a little going to be a little cerebral uh, today. I think. Yeah. Um. We'd like to talk about a case today that you know I have to say, Stephen, that before we started the episode today, I, it, it wasn't without some angst. Uh, in terms of the case, the subject matter, the topic, um, the completely profound ability to misunderstand argument, position, and opinion for um, uh, belief, uh, and the confusion between the two. And, and that, you know, it really does highlight, I think, the case and the decision and the subject matter highlights a great uh, divide in our society um, between, you know, viewpoints and the uh, complete intolerance uh, of alternate or different points of view by on all sides of the on all sides of the spectrum. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, my, well, I think it really is a reflection of uh, North American society in particular. I can't speak to Europe uh, because we don't live there, uh, but it's um, reflective. The decision, to me, is reflective of where society's headed, and you're either on one side of the uh, fence or you're on the other side, and there's no compromise anymore. Right, and just so everyone's hanging, what, they're right, what the heck are you guys talking about? <laughs> what, case, <laughs> what case are we talking well, could. <laughs> what case could it possibly be? Um, you know, maybe we should start a contest for a prize. Pick that case. Um, it's of course the decision involving Jordan Peterson uh, versus the College of Psychologists of Ontario, which is a very recent decision from the Divisional Court in Ontario, um, which was a judicial review application of a decision of a tribunal of the college. And I think that context becomes pretty important in the in the legal framework that this um, uh, debate uh, took before the divisional court. And and uh, this is a really good example, Gavin, of why we've uh, named this podcast Underneath the Law. Beneath. Be beneath. Uh, we're, sorry, beneath. We're underneath. We're definitely <laughs> underneath. We're trampled by it. <laughs> well, I, I, I might be underneath the ground after this podcast. Uh, <laughs> Uh, airs, right? So, uh, yes, Beneath the Law, uh, uh, my apologies there. I don't even know the name of our own podcast uh, sometime. Well, it but, does roll over you. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, but there is a legal justification for the decision of the divisional court. Uh, but there is a um, certainly political or public debate uh, that lies... Uh, you know, throughout right now uh, that is being talked about. Uh, so there are two layers here, right? There is that public debate in terms of what people see on the surface uh, as to what this decision means. But when you get beneath uh, the law here, there's actually a legal justification for the divisional court's decision. Yes, that absolutely true. So, you know, a couple of things that... that uh, you, you, I doubt that there's very many of our listeners that have not uh, heard of Jordan Peterson. He he's a controversial figure. There's there's no question about it. He is strident uh, in various opinions uh, that fly in the face of others who are equally, if not more, strident in their counter opinions. And the clash of opinion uh, is, you know, I don't know necessarily a bad thing to my mind. Um, but it seems to be a bad thing in a lot of people's minds these days that there is such a thing as someone who holds a different opinion. And I would suggest to you that both Ms. Uh, Dr. Peterson uh, and those who oppose him are probably guilty of that. 
in in a uh, mean spirited way. Um, I think too. Sometimes, well, for sure. I mean, you know, uh, we see that uh, with respect to protests. I mean, po- protests um, have a lot of anger in them. You have one side uh, shouting at the top of their lungs, uh, and then the other side is shouting at the top of their lungs, uh, each um, purporting uh, to act, uh, you know, uh, wrap themselves in the flag of uh, democracy, uh, that they uh, are entitled to free speech and to voice their opinions. And they do it in a very passionate way. And when I read the decision um, and the commentary that has uh, followed, uh, I think I'm struck by the fact that it's all about um, not now what is in the eyes of the beholder, but is what is in the ears of the beholder, uh, because it was about tone and not necessarily about what he said, but the manner in which he said it that led to uh, the orders from the College of uh, of uh, Psychology. Right. So let's let's step back for a minute because this is something uh, you know kind of near and dear to my own uh, heart and view of the world. Uh, and I've always approached this. You know, look, I've been involved. I've been a, a lawyer for over thirty years, as a few. Um, been involved in lots of cases um, where you know, hopefully one more than I lost lost my fair share of cases. I mean, I, I, I know one of our uh, mutual mentors, um, the late, great uh, Lloyd Holden, said to me, you know, a lawyer doesn't know anything until they've lost their first hundred cases. So uh, it really raises a point that the whole system of justice that we practice in and have uh, have made our livelihood in um, is predicated on a, on a adversarial system in the sense that there are two sides, uh, they get up, they argue two uh, different points of view, uh, they argue two positions based on the same set of facts and urge the court to come out in one way or the other. It is, by definition, a debate. It is, a, by definition, a system that is predicated on the notion that there are two uh, particular you know, viewpoints of any given problem, and that in the debate, the court can distill what is perhaps either the right one or the wrong one, or perhaps even more importantly, some hybrid of the two that comes to some just result as to the particular issue. So when I when I see this type of um, you know clamp down on alternative points of view and or contrary points of view, I, I, it troubles me, and it really doesn't. Frankly, it doesn't matter to me what the point of view is. I always think that everyone is entitled to disagree. I agree with that, except um, there are certainly within uh, uh, our prevailing society, and I think any society, in order for it to function, uh, has to have limits um, on free speech. Uh, we see that every day. It's, it's you know, you can't defame somebody, right? If you cause reputational harm uh, by, uh, you know, making statements that are false about somebody, there's certainly a cause of action uh, uh, in the civil courts, uh, people that advocate hatred uh, towards either a certain group, whether that's based on cultural identity uh, or religion, that's a crime, um, and that's punishable. And so uh, society does set up limits uh, with respect to uh, the freedom to of, of uh, free speech, and the courts have said that on a number of occasions. Um, and that's uh, not necessarily, in, in my viewpoint, uh, incorrect. But what I guess I'm concerned about with respect to Mr. Peterson or Dr. Peterson's case um, is that it really dug down into the tone of, uh, of his statements. Um, you know, a couple of the issues are certainly very controversial. Um, and, and uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't necessarily... Uh, agree with his opinions, I suppose. But to be honest, I really don't listen to Dr. Peterson a heck of a lot, uh, uh, if at all. And um, uh, but some of the other comments, you know, seem to have been pretty minor. So, so let's back this up for a moment, just to give a framework um, for our listeners. And uh, you know, many of whom are lawyers and probably will go will not need this. But for those that aren't, um, this is a this was an application for judicial review 
of an administrative tribunal decision. And that, that's an important context um, from a legal perspective. Uh, judicial review is generally available uh, for tribunal or administrative type decisions of boards or uh, disciplinary of various disciplinary bodies of various organizations. And what that is about is if you, you know, it's not an appeal per se, it is a very, very different process in administrative law, whereby a party who is unhappy with a decision of administrative tribunal can bring that decision forward to a court for review by a judge and or panel of judges. In this particular instance, it was a panel of judges of the Divisional Court of Ontario. And that particular framework, however, has very, very strict um, guidelines for the court and framed within a body of law that is very robust uh, in regards to a term which is thrown around quite a bit in judicial review applications, which is deference to the decision of the original body. And that flows from a basic concept that the courts have adopted up to and including the Supreme Court of Canada which is to say, look, there are very specialized tribunals, all, which all they do is deal with one given subject matter or another given subject matter. They know a lot more about that subject matter than the court will, which a court is, of course, a, a general body. Judges are very, very knowledgeable about a great number of things. But the the, the idea is, is that courts are jacks of all trades and uh, uh, tribunals are masters of their own. So... There is this notion of deference, which means that the court will very, very rarely interfere in a substantively in a decision of a tribunal. They can interfere for issues such as fairness or bias or something of that nature, which goes to the root of the decision. So in that framework, of course, judicial review applications are, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the statistics are. You may have a better sense of this than I do. They're rarely successful. They're very difficult. Uh, it is a high bar uh, to get over a, a JR judicial review application. Would you agree with that? I, I would agree with that because it's basically uh, very much like an appeal of a decision uh, of a lower court. And we all know that, uh, what, 80% of appeals get dismissed. Yeah, I think it's harder, personally. I think it's harder uh, to 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 overturn a administrative tribunal decision frankly, than a, a lower court decision. I think the tools in the toolbox may be li more limited. I, 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 right. And I agree with that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when you look at it, uh, I think one of the basic concepts that has now come out from the Supreme Court of Canada is that um, you look at the reasonableness of the decision of the tribunal. And what is the reasonableness of the decision uh, was basically defined by the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in a case called uh, Vavilov as being one that is based on an internally coherent and rational chain of analysis that is justified in relation to the facts and law that constrain the decision maker. And really, that is the crux, I think, of the uh, divisional court decision when they looked at the complaints that had been made um, to the College of Psychologists about the comments and the statements uh, that Dr. Peterson uh, was making. Uh, and, you know, I really didn't get a uh, appreciation of this. And I think it's important for the listener to understand what you read in the media does not necessarily reflect all of the facts in a case. And there seems to have been, um, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Gavin, but reading through this case, there was a, uh, a series of um, letters that this, the college had written to Dr. Peterson prior to an actual uh, disciplinary kind of proceeding taking place, uh, 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 whereby the college then made its decision. So there was some escalating correspondence going back and forth before it even reached the stage of a decision being made by the, by the college. And I think that was important in terms of overall context of where the uh, College of Psychologists made their ultimate decision uh, requiring Dr. Peterson to take this uh, coaching. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a very important point. Um, certainly, there was a series of uh, communication, which, if I can paraphrase it, basically was tone it down, 
both both in terms of I I will say, I think both in terms of the manner of the manner in which these opinions were expressed, uh, and in terms of the opinions themselves, and then I think also important in that is the actual punishment, if I can call it that, that was meted out by the college to Dr. Peterson, which, you know, respectfully is pretty low on the totem pole, if I, I might get in trouble for that reference, um, pretty low in terms of the the uh, variety of uh, discipline that the college could have meted out. Basically, what they, what they required of Dr. Peterson was that he engage in coaching or continuing education in respect of the use uh, of social media and in terms of the the manner in which he expressed his opinions. Curious um, uh, curious type of punishment, if you will, or or result, but that was what ultimately what they did. And one might one might ask themselves, well, so what? Uh, professional bodies regularly require members to engage in all sorts of uh, required extra learning and or outside uh, professional development. Um, and so that was nothing particularly onerous, I would have thought. But it was all based upon uh, and faced the arguments from Dr. Peterson that, number one, that he is, that all of this infringed his charter-protected right of freedom of speech uh, and none of his comments, he said, took place in the context of his role as a professional uh, or a qualified psychologist. Well, and and that uh, for me, Gavin, you know, uh, we've we've entered this podcast assigned to talk about this case, uh, but that's kind of the scary thing for me in terms of as I understand it. Um, it's only because his podcast contained his biography. And it wasn't that he was professing to give uh, anybody advice, um, uh, uh, psychological kind of advice or, or, or any advice of that nature. It's just that his podcast uh, has his biography. So, you know, here we are as uh, lawyers and frequently lawyers, um, you know, get asked to run as candidates in either, uh, you know, provincial elections or federal elections. And you need to speak passionately about certain topics uh, that you know, touch at the heart of societal values, uh, whether it's the abortion debate or um, issues related to, you know, we're seeing it now, New Brunswick and Saskatchewan have passed legislation with respect to pronouns uh, and and who is supposed to uh, uh, be the decision maker. And we're seeing that now in Ontario, uh, you know, uh, with respect to uh, that the parents should be the ones making decisions on that issue. And you run as a candidate, you certainly put your biography on your website and your brochure, and suddenly everybody knows that you're a lawyer and you're speaking passionately about issues that some people may believe um, is really offensive. And it's, uh, you know, what I'm struck by overall is that Dr. Peterson was disciplined, uh, and, and you said it, the college basically told him to tone it down. And it was the tone of, of the discussion and not really the debate about the issue, which is the lifeblood about of democracy. Yeah. So this is really, this to me is the real crux of the conundrum, if you will, in terms of the decision here and the whole, the whole matrix of it. Um, let, you know, let's be clear. I think that, that the case stands at a pretty clear proposition as follows. It's a Dr. Peterson... Uh, I call him Dr. Peterson because I think this is what he is. Um, but he hasn't been a, has been practicing as a doctor, so so to speak, for a long time. I mean, I think at one point he was a clinical psychologist who saw patients in the course of a clinical practice, and he was very much a practicing psychologist. I mean, I think the reality of uh, uh, this gentleman's life at this point in time is, is he's, kind of, I would say, transcended, but He's moved beyond that in terms of what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't think he sees patients anymore. He's become a worldwide, um, uh, you know... He's an influencer. Uh, he, he is a social media star around the world. I'm sure he makes 
an enormous amount of money uh, doing that, good on him. Uh, he's got lots of people who follow him. Lots of people listen to his his podcast, and if that was the purpose of it, um, he said very well. Now, obviously, you know, with podcasts of, that, of this sort, I mean, being controversial, frankly, is is probably helpful. Uh, the more controversial you are, sometimes the more people listen to you. So, but he doesn't really practice psychology anymore. So, just picking up on your point, but he he is very much a licensed clinical psychologist. I mean, he he could theoretically practice psychology if he wanted to. He's licensed to do it, or he was, or he, he isn't currently. I don't know if he's suspended or not. Um, but very much to your point that uh, it's if you're a lawyer, and we're lawyers, we're licensed to practice law, that's a fact. That is, we are, we are licensed to do something uh, to earn a living doing it, just like a professional engineer or a medical doctor or any other number of, or, you know, a, a, a licensed plumber. Uh, you name it. Uh, you, you know, that is your profession, uh, and that's who you are. Picking up on your point, let's say that as a lawyer, licensed to practice law, qualified, went to law school, passed the bar exam, all of those things, I decided to run for a political party um, that had, some people might call, extreme views. Um, and I was running on the platform of that party. Let's say I ran for, I don't know, the People's Party of Canada. And I was espousing points of view that obviously a lot of people would find quite offensive. Um, would my disciplinary body, in our, in our case, the Law Society of Ontario, have the right to discipline us because we express those viewpoints just because we're lawyers? Well, and, and but it falls within a spectrum. And, and this is what the divisional court said was the College of Psychologists uh, were entitled to make a decision uh, with respect to um, Dr. Peterson's comments, notwithstanding that Dr. Peterson said that uh, those comments were made off duty. And reading the divisional court judgment, there are a number of judgments uh, that have found that regardless that you're, quote, off duty, and uh, to be quite honest, Gavin, I think uh, you know, nowadays it's almost uh, 24-7 in terms of practicing law. You're never off duty. Uh, like we're so busy, but uh, like uh, we're, what concerns me is where do you draw the line? And and I'm not sure where the line exists, which makes uh, things very, very difficult uh, from an, a legal analysis point of view that I really, I couldn't give you any advice, Gavin. And, and basically I would say, well, you know what, uh, 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 given the spectrum of uh, that uh, that a, uh, a regulatory body uh, can apply, uh, you know, maybe those comments could uh, uh, cross the line, so to speak, wherever that line is, and then you could get into trouble. I think there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think, and this is one of the things when we talked started off today talking about our trepidation and angst, I mean, it's a real concern. I think if you're a professional person and you have, you know, it's, is it possible even even as a even as a lawyer, uh, to take what are t potentially unpopular uh, views that um, on behalf of a client or otherwise, uh, and to have that then say, well, you can't say that, uh, you can't espouse that argument. Um, I've I, you know there are many many uh, examples, um, and I, it really is troubling uh, that to me, anyways, that. Uh, that exists. I think the, the fact is, is that you can debunk the argument and debunk uh, the position, but I don't know when you take it to the next level to, to say that you have to then persecute or prosecute the individual who espouses that point of view or what have you. You've taken it to the next level. You're not debunking an argument anymore. You're now debunking the person. No, but it's, it's look, we, we hear about uh, chilling effects. Uh, certainly, you know, you and I have been involved in a number of defamation cases uh, uh, and uh, the use of the court system to basically have a chilling effect uh, on the uh, defendant's right of uh, of free speech, and so there are uh, you know certainly processes in place in uh, British Columbia and Ontario uh, that allow a defendant to dismiss a claim like that, uh, where basically the target uh, uh, or the purpose of the action is to uh, uh, place a restraint on the defendant's freedom to speak uh, uh, freely uh, on on issues that may concern a plaintiff. 
Uh, but this is kind of the opposite. Now I have a, a decision, uh, whether it's the college's decision or the divisional court's decision at the en end of the day in terms of the analysis, that seems to have a chilling effect uh, uh, based on your profession. And, and, and for some of us, uh, certainly as lawyers, we need to, as, as you indicated earlier, uh, advocate uh, zealously on behalf of clients. Uh, people come to us uh, uh, for advocacy on various issues, whether it's client-related matters or political matters. And now, you know, I, I've got to tell you, uh, somebody came up to me the other day to talk about the um, Dundas Street situation, right? And, and for our listeners, so the city of Toronto has basically decided or is contemplating uh, changing the name of one of the streets that goes through the city, Dundas, because uh, there was some lobbying that uh, Henry Dundas uh, was a slave owner and promoted slavery. And somebody came up to me and said, that's not quite correct. That basically the facts are a little bit different. Henry Dundas um, uh, appointed John uh, Graves Simcoe. Lord Simcoe was the first uh, slavery abolitionist in North America. And you know, can I talk about that issue? Uh, it's a very can I take a position? It's a very interesting question because, of course, this is one of the it gets it, it comes back to what we we're talking about before. We we we've you know kind of grown up in an adversarial system where there is this notion that you know there are two sides to every argument, uh, and in somewhere in between them is the truth, and somewhere in between them is justice. Um, but that's very different. And, and that comes out of a long history. I don't bore everyone with the historical references, but I mean, we all know uh, of the history of orthodoxy, and I use that term not in a religious sense, but just in a, an accepted, uh, orthodoxy is defined actually as the generally accepted beliefs of society at a particular time. And certainly throughout you know, the Middle Ages and such, there was an orthodoxy uh, throughout uh, Europe that you know, saw various people burned at the stake, for example, for heresy. So, you know, it always reminds me of the, you know, Galileo Galilei you know, being asked to recant at the roundness of the earth uh, and uh, and asked to say, say the world isn't round. And his answer was, but it is because it is. Well, sorry, I've done not to offend the flat earth people out there. Um, but, you know, there there is orthodoxy is if you say something that offends a a set of beliefs that people hold unchallengeable. Um, the only response to that has to be to repress that contrary point of view. And, you know, the whole notion of small liberalism uh, and debate came out of what what the Enlightenment, which was that we threw off the chains of that particular orthodoxy and that there was now debate and science and review and, and all of those things. And I, I just, it troubles me that we're falling back into, on both sides of the spectrum, into this notion that I can't hear a contrary viewpoint that challenges my view because uh, otherwise my my view cannot stand up to that challenge rather than confronting the challenge head on is is really to douse it or to quiet it or to say you can't say that uh just like Galileo sure but that uh, Gavin in my view strikes at the heart of democracy right anybody who has taken a political science 101 course will understand that uh, democracy advances because you have um, people on competing sides of an issue being able to freely speak uh, about those issues and have an opinion on those issues. And the way that society advances is through that debate um, to come up with, say, uh, a conclusion or a decision as to which uh, uh, side of the debate should carry the day should carry the day, and and that's what social movements are all about. If you look at Black Lives Matter or defunding the police, those are social movements. Which, uh, frankly, if you're a police supporter, you would find uh, a heresy in those comments to defund the police. But that you have the debate about defunding the police causes. Um, thought 
on on the other side of the fence to say, okay, you know what, maybe we should uh, modify our policing tactics. Exactly. Right, rather than suppressing the view. Exactly, because the contrary point of view ha- allows for improvement on all sides of the equation. Um, and, you know, it sometimes, it, you know, and I think on both sides of that, on both sides of that, there would be a heresy uh, if your belief system uh, is such that cannot accept a contrary point of view and or improve or, or evolve your thinking uh, based on uh, another perspective. But, you know, one of the, one of the topics, just to sort of, I don't mean to be <laughs> delving back in the historical analysis here, but one of the, one of the le- I would have thought, less controversial comments of Dr. Peterson that was highlighted in one of the complaint letters was he's got some notion about, um, uh, there was some debate about overpopulation on the, on, on the planet. And, he, you know, his, Dr. Peterson's, I think, I think his view, and I, maybe I'm stating it, if I am, I apologize. Um, but that you know that that overpopulation of the planet is is a problem. Uh, that there are just frankly there are a lot of there are maybe too many people around. And he probably yeah. stole that from uh, one of the Da Vinci Code movies that I was actually <laughs> watching the other night. But, it, but his comment, I think, was was I think his comment, I think his comment is satire. I thought it was satire. He talked about oh well something about oh well they're just poor children anyway, so who cares? Um, and I thought it was satirical in the sense that you know very much uh, reminded me, frankly, the comment of Jonathan Swift, who, of course, was a satirist of the First Order and, and led to great political change in, uh, in Britain at the time. And his, his comment, in, and he wrote something called A Modest Proposal, where he suggested at the time, because children were starving in Ireland, or people were starving in Ireland, that the solution was pretty simple. Just have the Irish eat their children and everything will be fine because they're producing too many of them. And if they're hungry, that's what they should do. And it, it was obviously outrageous and ridiculous and satirical, but what it did is it held up to light uh, the, the equally oppressive and absurd position on the other side uh, through satire. And, you know, is Dr. is Dr. Peterson now not allowed to be satirical? Would Jonathan Swift, if he were a practicing psychologist, um, lose his license in 2023 if he made the comments he made in A Modest Proposal? Uh, I don't know. Again, I I can't tell you because I don't know where the line is. Well, that's, I think fundamentally, I don't know where the line is, is critical. And it seems that professional regulatory organizations get to draw that line wherever the particular body or wherever the particular view at the time um, decides it may be. I mean, what what the court said in, in the Peterson case was, quote, like, the legal profession, the health profession, recognizes limitations on free expression to, quote, ma- maintain, quote, boundaries of civility and professionalism. So I guess the, my question to you is boundaries of civility. Who decides what those boundaries are? The decision maker. Well, that I guess the question is who's, right? who decides who's the decision maker. Well, and exactly. And, and who gets appointed to be a decision maker by a uh, self-regulatory body. And, you know, I mean, we've had this debate, Gavin, within our own law society on statements of principles uh, that we were all asked to adopt. Uh, A number of uh, members of the profession fought against that to basically repeal that statement of principles. Uh, But it led to a great debate uh, within our own profession as to how far should our regulatory bodies go um, to basically tell us how to think uh, or how to act. Well, it's not just to tell us how to think or act, but to require, in our in the case of the Statement of Principles, just in case our listeners aren't familiar with that, it was actually a requirement that you file a signed uh, statement that said you agree to it. It is and an, an oath, or, uh, so to speak, a, a profession of faith. Right. Let's, <laughs> so that you know that that I think uh, inspired uh, the the backlash uh, within the profession on that. And let, and let me say this: I don't think, for the most part, I mean, there may be some people who didn't agree with it, but the, they were statements of principles that I think most people would not would would agree with and not have a particular issue with uh, particular right. problem with voluntarily saying, "Yeah, I." 
that makes perfect sense. And I try to live my life like that, or I try to practice law like that. I think the question was, was the compulsion issue, which was the notion that, you know, you need to stand up and swear to this in front of everyone or else you cannot make a living. No. That, yeah. And, that's and, and certainly, uh, uh, Gavin, just to kind of take this beyond um, uh, the decision, I find that there's a much greater backlash today uh, than there was, uh, you know, when you and I were growing up of being told what to do. Right. You were told what to do, but you kind of followed those rules because that was the um, accepted uh, uh, societal norm at the time. Uh, but I really find now that uh, other people telling uh, somebody what to do is leading to this backlash. And it's the debate. And, and when you look at it, uh, Dr. Peterson, Donald Trump uh, in particular, are representative of a counterculture uh, of, uh, you know, they're being told now what to do by the people who didn't like being told what to do. Yeah, it, 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 there is an irony to, to this, that the views that are being expressed as the new, what well, I'll, I'll get told for this, the new orthodoxy are the, uh, are exactly the, those who, you know, 50 to 60 years ago were on the other side of the then orthodoxy and were outcasts and castigated, um, for their points of view. Tolerance um, was not something that was known for those particular groups uh, in that time. And tolerance, I expect, by those particular, is not being shown now on the other side. I, I don't know that you can tolerate, um, you know, views that are objectionable or abhorrent or espouse violence or espouse hatred. No one can really tolerate that. Well, we, we, sh we shouldn't tolerate those, those points of views, but... Um, you know, you, get, you made the point about satire. Uh, you know, if I said, uh, you know, uh, in response to a politician who takes a position that I don't believe in and I express it as, really? Would I be in, the, in trouble for that? Yeah, it's, 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 it's remarkable what you can not say or, or what you cannot even allow to be said. And I mean, it, 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 it is troubling in, in a lot of ways because how can you have, and going back to our point, how can you have a debate on any issue unless both sides of the argument are allowed to be heard? And let me say this, how, how would you ever know that one side of an argument is completely nonsense um, unless you were able to hear it? I mean, the, 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 the one thing about ridiculous points of view is they're exposed when they're made. Right, exactly. And I, and, I, and I think you're right. I think that people like Donald Trump, creatures like Donald Trump, um, and I call him creatures because he's a phenomenon, because he's a phenomenon of those who feel they are now disaffected, uh, disempowered, uh, that their, uh, their place in society has been lost, and they feel that he's their voice. He, and that's all as a result of, uh, you know, this sort of, viewpoint that thou, you know, that he has capitalized on, frankly, and I think quite cynically, um, by saying that you are the disempowered, disenfranchised, and I am now your voice, and we're going to come back, and that type of sentiment. And I think, you know, people who scratch their head and can't figure out why he gets popularity every time a new indictment falls down on him, need to, th to think about that. that. That's exactly why, because it's, what that does is it proves to his following See, they're out to get me, which means they're out to get you. Right. Uh, the Peterson case, he, this, as I understand it, um, there's a, the a promise of an appeal, a uh, further appeal, or seeking an appeal. What do you think the chances are there? Uh, oh, oh uh, I think he needs leave to appeal, uh, first of all. I'm not, I'm not sure from the route, but regardless of what route, uh, I, I don't see a, a appeal being successful because it's based on the principles of of administrative law, and and that's the legal justification uh, that the divisional court uh, really can uh, rest against. It has nothing to do uh, overall uh, uh, with the content of uh, the college's decision. It's the process, and was it a reasonable decision uh, uh, within the analysis of administrative law? So unless you change the principles of administrative law again. Uh, you know, uh, I, I really don't uh, uh, see 
an appeal being successful. But at you know, on the same token, is that really important um, uh, to Doctor Peterson, and and does he really want to use the appeal as a platform to further the debate on this issue? And you know, uh, just getting back to uh, one of your earlier comments, you know, you think about uh, particularly in the United States. The United States allows the Ku Klux Klan to march, and they march, and it exposes um, the weakness of their position and what they're trying to promote, and that helps society advance. I, I agree with that. I mean, that, uh, just to leave that point, I mean, I think an appeal will, I, I don't know if leave will be granted, um, but just quoting from the Supreme Court of Canada, and this is really, I think, the, the what well, your point is in a nutshell, what the court, uh, Supreme Court said in Vast. Vas- Vavilov, right, was that the role of the courts in these circumstances is to review, and they are, at least as a general rule, to refrain from deciding the issues themselves. In other words, the role of the court in a judicial review application is very, very limited, very constrained. But but I will say that I can see, being the contrarian that I am, um, just like Donald Trump, I can see why there might be a benefit uh, to losing that appeal, uh, to further gain traction uh, on this um, alienation type, isolation view that has propelled, you know, people like Donald Trump and et cetera, uh, to extreme popularity among certain segments of the population. It can be used to say, look, you see, I can't, you can't even say this anymore. The courts will back them up. They're trying to shut you down. They're trying to shut me down, which means trying to shut us down. And I think that's 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 a problem. And it gets all back to the uh, certainly the books that I read in high school. Here we are, 1984, Brave New World. Well, uh, yeah, that, it's what, you're right. 40 years too late. You're, you're, you're being watched <laughs> and uh, everything that you say or think will be uh, uh, surgically uh, parsed uh, to determine whether you've crossed the line. And by the way, I should say this. I do not promote the KKK. In fact, uh, you know, I'd be uh, well on the other side of the fence with respect to that uh, and uh, and the values that they promote. Uh, those are not the values that I promote. But. No, but I think that it comes back to the, it comes back, I think it was, I, think, I actually think it might have been that case. Was it, what rings in my mind is, and I can't remember what U.S. Supreme Court Justice said it, but there was a statement about when talking about freedom of speech that it's not important for the things you love. It's important for the things you hate. Uh, it Freedom of speech for people to sit around and say a bunch of stuff that everybody agrees with isn't much of a freedom at all. Freedom of speech only really matters uh, when you can say things that people don't agree with. Uh, uh, otherwise, what do I need a right for? We, 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 we can probably leave it at that. And uh, it's a really great uh, question for our listeners to contemplate. Yeah. So once again, thank you very much for joining us for what is probably a fairly controversial episode of Beneath the Law. Very interested in your feedback, especially if you don't agree with us, uh, especially if you've got a contrary point of view. Um, always interested to hear that. Always interested to learn from it. Always interested to try to spin the argument around and look at it from a different perspective, uh, because that's how laws make. That that's how arguments are crafted and understanding. The other side of the argument is, in my view, the secret to good advocacy in any particular, uh, be it courtroom argument or otherwise, and societal debate. Um, and looking at the world from the perspective of another is always an interesting way to go about it. So please send us your comments, criticisms, kudos, if you have them. Um, and please give us a rating if you can uh, on your uh, favorite podcast supplier. And thank you once again for tuning in and listening. Really appreciate it, Stephen. Until next time, always remember that if no one is above the law, everyone is beneath it.